Hello everyone, my name is Christoph Troch. I work for the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research and I will be presenting the long wave mitigation study for the port of Nucha. The study was done by the CSR together with WSP and Transnet Ports Authority. Just a quick introduction for those not familiar with the port or South Africa. The port of Nucha is situated in Algoa Bay. It's about 20 kilometers northeast of Port Elizabeth. It's located in South Africa. South Africa is a country on the southernmost tip of Africa. Here on the bottom right you can see an image displaying South Africa as well as a satellite image showing the position and layout of the port on the eastern coast as it was in 2017. The port is the newest of the South African ports and operations only commenced in 2009. It was originally planned to be a bulk port but it has however been adapted for container handling. Significant future expansion and growth is planned for the port, but the port does however experience problems with mud container vessels. Due to these reasons, the port has investigated various ways to improve these mooring conditions at the Keys. One of the main contributing factors to the mooring problems are long period waves. Long period waves are waves with periods of about 25 to 350 seconds and are generally quite small in wave height when compared to swell waves. But due to the shape of the port, these waves can induce basin and moored vessel resonance. To investigate solutions and mitigation measures, a comprehensive study was required. But due to the extent of the project, a four-phase approach was followed. In phase one, we looked at the physical alterations or expansions to the present port layout to see what mitigating effects it would have on the long period wave climate inside the port. Phase 2 focused on the numerical modeling of the short and long period wave climate inside the port for the identified layout changes. This also included the calibration and verification of the models with measured wave data. Phase 3 was the mooring ship motion study which investigated alternative mooring arrangements to reduce the effect of long waves on the moored vessels. Phase 4 was the berth operability study to compare the possible improvements on the port operations as identified in Phase 1 and 3. So in phase 1, a Nesset Swan model was used to compute the swell wave propagation into the bay, as seen in blue, green and red. A circuit model covering the port area indicated by black was used to compute long wave propagation into the port. Here is an example of swell wave height and direction output from one of the Nesset Swan grids for a single event. The Swan wave spectrum at the circuit boundary is used to generate long waves for the circuit model. Here is an example of the water level showing the long period waves as computed with circuit for a snapshot in time. The circuit grid was set up so that it was capable of resolving waves for various port layouts. Here is also a significant long period wave height plot inside the port for a single wave condition showing the spatial distribution of the wave height. Here are a few examples of layout changes that were tested. First we have the present layout of the port which will be our base layout. Then we tested the fully extended breakwater of 2000 meters and future extension of the port inland. We looked at the opening of the salt works behind the port for 1.7 kilometers inland with a depth of 1 meter jar datum. The idea here was to have an escape for the long wave energy out of the basin area. We looked at various extension of the eastern breakwater, first with 2000 meters, 1000 meters, as well as 500 meters. The idea here was to stop the long wave energy from entering the port. Next we look at opening an area behind the basins. The basins here were extended about 60 meters inland and 70 meters of the berth was removed. This forms a channel with a width of about 130 meters. The idea here was to let the long wave energy move freely behind the two basins. Here we have the same idea but only removing part of the berth to form a channel width of 90 meters and also removing part of the berth to form a channel with a width of 50 meters and a depth of 5 meters. A platform would have need, needed to be constructed to connect the berth to the main port area for these options. We then looked at four channels or culverts, each with a width of 10 meters at the back of the western basin. The length of these channels range between 750 to 950 meters. The channel starts with a depth of 10 meters and gradually rises to a depth of 1 meter over a length of 130 meters. Then also the four channels options, including a channel behind the berths. Some of these mitigation measures are not necessarily very practical, but it was tested to get a better understanding of the long wave energy inside the port and to see what would actually be possible 
in terms of the reduction in the long wave energy. Here are the spatial percentage change in long wave height for each of the layouts relative to the base layout, with blue indicating a reduction and red indicating an increase in long wave height. This was determined by simulating the same single significant long wave event for each layout. One can see the long wave pattern change for the various port layouts, with some increasing in certain areas and decreasing in other areas. I will not discuss all the layouts in detail, but it can be seen that the opening of the salt works and the 4 channel option showed the consistent decrease in long wave height inside the port. These two options were thus chosen for further investigation. So phase 2 of the project was focused on the calibration of the models with measured wave data as well as modeling a complete wave climate for the port. This slide just shows a few images of the instrumentation used. The left image just shows our underwater ADCP and RBR pressure sensors. On the right you can see the permanent water level recorder located close to the container terminal which is used to extract long wave heights and also the wave rider buoy used to measure swell waves outside the port. In the middle satellite image you can see the approximate locations of the instruments. So quite an extensive measuring campaign was conducted. The model was then calibrated using the present layout. The same boundary conditions are applied to the alternative layouts to perform 24 swan runs together with 24 corresponding surf grid runs to form a framework. Measured swell wave data outside the port is then translated to long wave data at each berth location for each port layout. Here is an example for the month of June which contains two long wave events. The first three rows show the swell wave height, the period and direction outside the port. And the last row shows the measured long wave height in blue and the interpolated modeled output at the same location in red. Here you can see a long wave height exceedance plot for the same location for the modeled and measured data. A good comparison was achieved. Exceedance curves and tables as well as extreme statistical analysis were done for all the birth locations for all alternative port layouts to give a more detailed insight to long wave height reductions. The plot shows the exceedance curve at one of the berths at the container terminal for long wave heights for the current layout in blue, the salt work option in red and the channel option in yellow. Anywhere from 10 to 30% reduction in long wave height can be seen for this berth. Here to the right you can see an example of the evolution of the long period wave spectrum as it enters the port. The blue spectrum shows the long wave energy outside the port and the other curves shows the spectrum at the birth location at the container terminal for the various port changes. The birth location shows a strong enhancement of, of the energy at 250 seconds and a secondary focusing of energy at around 140 seconds. If the natural period of the moored vessel is close to the frequencies where energy focusing occurs, the moored vessel can resonate. Here is a visual representation of the water level showing the strong enhancement of the energy at 250 seconds on the left and the secondary focusing of energy at around 140 seconds on the right. Here all other water level frequencies were filtered out and only the frequency bands as indicated above the plot is represented. On the left a wave of half wavelength can be seen resonating in the port in a north-south direction and on the right a wave of full wavelength can be seen resonating in a north-south direction and a half wavelength in the east-west direction. The long wave modeling studies gave a good indication of the impact alternative layouts would have on the long wave climate at the various berths in the port. The moored ship response at a berth is, however, also dependent on the wave field, the type and size of the moored vessel, as well as the mooring arrangement used. The main objective of phase 3 is to identify the optimal mooring layout for each berth. The berths are indicated on the image to the right. Various mooring arrangements and systems were tested on a 9000 TU container vessel at the D berth, a 100,000 deadweight ton bulk carrier at the A, B and C berth, as well as a 70,000 deadweight ton bulk carrier at the B berth. Various mooring arrangements were simulated. This included various patterns of conventional mooring layouts with changes to pre-tension, the amount of lines, the line types. A hydraulic tensioning system was also tested for two and four units, so similar to the dy dynamoor and short tension system. An automated mooring system was also tested at the D bus, similar to the Cavitec system currently installed at one of the berths. Each mooring arrangement was simulated for a storm event, which includes the long and short period waves, 
with and without a critical wind condition, that would be the easterly and the westerly wind condition direction, a vessel in ballast in laden condition for each port layout option. The best performing wearing arrangement based on minimum surge, sway, wearing line forces were identified for each vessel at each berth. Here is a visual output from the dynamic mooring simulation, comparing the container vessel moored with a conventional mooring pattern using polypropylene lines at the top and four hydraulic tensioning units at the bottom. Note the significant reduction in vessel motions where the tensioning units are applied. The water levels as calculated with the surfing model clearly shows the interaction between the vessel motion and the long waves. The hydrodynamic forces on the vessel was calculated with WaveScat and the moored vessel analysis was simulated with Keysim, both software developed at the CSRR. For phase 4, the birth operability study, all ship motion simulations were conducted for the complete framework of wave conditions for all the designed vessels in ballast and laden conditions. All berth locations, the preferred mooring arrangements and port layout options as well as the critical wind conditions. The critical wind conditions were determined by a joint occurrence analysis of long wave height, wind velocity and direction. The plot on the right shows the distribution of long wave heights with the wind velocity and direction with the red peak showing where the largest long wave heights occur. From this, three critical wind wave conditions were identified. The limiting wave heights were then estimated for all these situations based on limiting criteria such as mooring line forces, fender compressions and ship motions amplitudes. From the limiting wave heights, the operability and downtime could be determined using wave height and directional occurrence tables. The birth operability is linked to vessel motions, whereas the downtime is linked to mooring line forces and fender compressions. Below is an example of one of the operability and downtime results. The first column shows the birth location, the second column the vessel type, the third the mooring arrangements, and the fourth the port layout options. The operability and downtime percentages follow in each row where each column shows the percentage loaded condition of the vessel, with zero being ballast and 100% being fully laden. From this, the impact of each mitigation option can be evaluated. Okay, just some conclusions. It was shown that it is possible to reduce long waves inside a port by changing the layout, but this can however not always be implemented for all ports and will most likely need to be major alterations. The impact of long waves on moored vessels can be relatively well mitigated by using alternative mooring arrangements and techniques. In this study, the hydraulic tensioning system proved itself to be a good option in mitigating the effect of long waves. A multi-criteria analysis was done taking the layout options and the various mooring ranges into account. This included aspects such as effectiveness, cost, maintenance, implementation time, expansion potential and environmental effects. From this, the saltwork option and the inclusion of the hydraulic tensioning system appears to be the most attractive option given the practicality of implementing the structural changes and ease of installing the hydraulic tensioning system. Thank you.